I will uh, take um, a moment to uh, introduce uh, Nikhil to the, the audience. I met Nikhil through Google Summer of Code program in the very beginning of this year. So uh, <clears throat> as you already have some sort of spoiler from our cover slide, um, the Red Hand Lab and FrameNet Brazil worked together in a joint idea for this edition of uh, Google Summer of Code. And then Nikhil applied uh, to one of our spots with a great project. Uh, back then he was a MSc student in computational linguistics at the University of Edinburgh. And I have to say that it's a background information, but it's very important. He completed this project that we're going to present today while also completing his MSc dissertation at the same week, which is, you know, uh, it requires like a lot of applause. So uh, Nikhil is currently applying to several PhD <coughs> courses, programs in the US and uh, Europe. Um, and he will be sharing this uh, presentation with me. So the structure that we prepared uh, for this presentation uh, was that I'm going to uh, introduce the idea and provide some background on what we mean by construal uh, in, how, in this specific setting. And then Nikhil will uh, take over and present the project that he developed uh, under my mentorship. So uh, the, the idea for the presentation here is to present this road towards the identification of joint meaning construal using language and co-speech gestures. So the idea that um, we presented to the Google Summer of Code while we were applying as mentor organizations back in the end of uh, 2020 was that both FrameNet Brazil and uh, Red Hand were investigating for some time how meaning is construed in multimodal communication. So we uh, have had previous uh, Google Summer of Code students working, uh, for example, on frame blends uh, in, in Red Hand and on building a, a module for our annotation tool, our frame semantics based annotation tool for dealing with uh, audio video data, for example, for multimodal corpora. Uh, but those two labs had kind of different um, ways of approaching the problem. Red Hand has always been more focused on, or has uh, had more background back then on investigating co-speed gestures, while FrameNet Brazil uh, was more interested until that moment in uh, annotating video and audio sequences for uh, frames, which is the work, for example, of both uh, Fred Belcavello and Marcelo Virigiano, who are uh, here today. So in a nutshell, what we wanted to do with this idea is to see whether we could identify joint meaning construal patterns, right? So to understand what we mean by joint meaning construal, I decided to, just to uh, provide some common background, provide you with a definition of construal that you find in uh, Trot et al. And I'm subsumed under the et al. in this paper. This was a, a paper that we gave in the special theme session of ACL last year, uh, in which we uh, provided a series of case studies arguing in favor of bringing construal into natural language processing. So our definition of construing that paper is that it's a dynamic process of meaning construction in which speakers and hearers encode and de decode respectively some intended meaning in a given communicative context. To do so, they draw on their repertoire of linguistic and conceptual structures, composing and transforming them to build coherent interpretations, consistent, consistent with the speaker's lexical, grammatical, and other expressive choices. So the main idea here is that language is diverse. It's a very, very powerful tool that allows you to uh, convey the same kind of meaning or some basic meaning or some sort of, uh, uh, how can I say, ground uh, uh, meaning in very different ways that can be shaped or can be focused or can be uh, portrayed differently depending on your choices, right? 
uh, on your linguistic choices. So in this paper, uh, we did, <clears throat> this is the, just the, 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 the first page of the paper, we uh, claimed in favor of reconstruing the very notion of what meaning is in natural language processing. And we departed from a set of construal dimensions that was built by our first uh, author, Sean Trott, currently a, a PhD student at UC San Diego, while he was uh, doing an internship with Nancy Chang at Google. So these dimensions of construal, this incomplete taxonomy that Shan produced involved five dimensions. So in this paper, we work with prominence, with resolution, with metaphor, perspective, and configuration. Those dimensions were um, based not only on a single author, but uh, on a series of readings and uh, comparisons that uh, we, we did back then. So <clears throat> we used some, some foundations from uh, work by Langeker, Taumi, and Proft, and uh, Wood. I'm going to give you a very broad notion of the kinds of phenomena in language that each of those uh, dimensions captures. So for example, Prominence, sometimes uh, also referred to as salience or profiling, refers to the kinds of choices that we can make while speaking to put things, <clears throat> sorry, in a more, um, how can I say, in, in more focus or in a more focused position. So for example, I can either say that a cat was chasing a mouse, or I can say that the mouse was being chased by the cat or was fleeing from the cat, right? Uh, I can also do that uh, when I bring uh, positions into uh, play. So if I say things like the cat is on the pillow or the pillow is under the cat, although I, I, I am portraying the same scene, I can be looking to the same uh, uh, image at that point. But if we pay attention, those two alternatives serve as answers for two different questions. Because if I ask, where's the cat? you would expect me to answer that the cat is on the pillow. But if I asked, where's the pillow? You wouldn't expect me to say that the cat is on the pillow. That wouldn't be a direct answer to your question, right? The direct answer would be that the pillow is under the cat. Um, resolution sometimes is also referred to as specificity or granularity. So I can refer to someone um, as Novak Djokovic. I can refer to this person as, uh, tennis player, I can refer to this person as someone from Serbia, or I can refer to him as a man, right? So uh, those expressions, those ways of referring to Novak Djokovic, for example, they are very different in the degree of granularity of the semantics that they specify about this referent. Metaphor is uh, basically structured mapping or cross-domain comparison when I can use a given domain to speak about another one. So uh, in Brazil, we have this uh, expression that something can um, mess up your middle field, meaning that some kind of happening can mess up with the whole schedule that you plan for that week. And it's based on the soccer domain to explain this uh, cross-domain mapping, for example. Uh, perspective, also called vantage point, uh, is the dimension of construal that explains those differences in the kinds of things you say, depending on from where you're looking at that situation, right? Uh, it's different from prominence. Uh, and I think that the best way to, to, to explain that is that, for example, I can say that there are, um, houses scattered around the valley. Or I can say the same thing as say, as you are uh, driving through Tuscany, you see houses here and there. So it's the same scene, but at one of, in the first one, I'm taking an aerial view, and in the other one, I'm taking the uh, motion perspective. And finally, configuration uh, refers to internal structure properties such as shape, texture, and the parade example is that I can refer to the colors of autumn 
by saying, for example, I like the colors of the autumn leaves or I love the, the color of autumn foliage, right? So I can refer to them as individual pieces of each one is a leaf or as a set also called foliage. So one question that uh, we could ask ourselves is like, does construal really matter for natural language processing like in daily unpretentious language use? So in this paper, we simulated a uh, um, dialogue with an assistant, right? Like a, a, a robot assistant. And imagine that you have a meeting with someone and then you could ask, when is my one one with Chuck? And then the assistant says 4 p.m. today in 15 minutes. And then you ask, is there another slot soon? And then not today, should I check tomorrow? And then, okay, let's push it to his tomorrow evening. And then the perfect assistant, which by the way does not exist, would say rescheduled one one with Chuck for 2 p.m. tomorrow, 6 p.m. in Brazil, right? So where is construal in this dialogue and why it's important for us that work with natural language processing to look at uh, this kind of phenomenon? So when uh, the assistant says that 4 p.m. today is in 15 minutes, he must assume the perspective, it must assume the perspective uh, of now, here, right? To calculate this time. Uh, but if I ask, is there another slot soon? Then prominence has to be brought into play because if it is in 15 minutes, then the current slot, is soon, but what I'm, what I'm asking is, is that another one, which is not this one, right? So I must take this, the current one as a reference point to the other one, there's a contrast. And when you ask soon, imagine if the assistant uh, answers yes in 16 minutes or in 15 minutes and one second. So the perfect answer would be, have to be not today, should I check tomorrow? But for an assistant to say so, this assistant would, be, would need to be able to calculate what soon means in the context of a meeting in a schedule that someone is trying to reschedule, right? This is taken for granted for all humans. And then when I say, let's push it, then there is a, a metaphor as the event as a physical object. And this is not the kind of metaphor that only occurs in poetry, you all know that. And when we use his tomorrow evening, then I have to shift perspective because there is a shift in time zone, right? So <clears throat> this was the basic idea developed in this paper, but then a question was, okay, Thiago, what does this have to do with modality, right? So to look at that, uh, take this Flickr 30K picture, it's in the Flickr uh, 30K data set, and this picture uh, has two captions in English. So you have a woman figure skater in a blue costume holds her leg in the air by the blade on her skate. And there is another one that looks at this same picture and says a man and a woman ice skating on a rink, right? Or in Portuguese, uh, there is also a caption, uh, caption that mentions both the, the woman and the man but this caption reads a uh, woman skating on an ice ring or ice track and a man also skating in the background. So although we have two characters in the English and in the Brazilian Portuguese caption, the Brazilian Portuguese caption puts the woman in a prominence, in prominence linguistically that matches the picture, but the English caption does not, right? Uh, as another example, we could uh, look at uh, resolution and compare, for example, the two, uh, the same two English captions again. In the first, uh, the, the character is a woman figure skater, and then in the second is a woman. So there is a degree of resolution that decreases between the first caption and the second caption, right? While in Portuguese, uh, the translation for a woman figure skater would be something like patinadora or skater, right? So depending on the language, you also have some sort of influence on the degree of resolution that you can adopt. But the question is, 
what about gesture? And then Nikhil is going to answer you. Uh, yeah, so hello everyone. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, uh, thank you Anna for you know, inviting us and giving us the opportunity to uh, you know, present uh, our GSOC project with all of you at the IMCC Oxford seminar. Uh, and you know, feel free to interrupt me at any point. Uh, I'm happy to take questions in between also. Uh, so without further ado, let's uh, kind of hop in. Uh, so, so far, I think uh, Tiago had, you know, given us a broad overview of how, you know, um, constituals work in, in, in terms of language, uh, specifically related to language. But uh, now I will expand upon how uh, you can use gestures in tandem with, uh, with language to identify these constituent dimensions. Right, so now uh, leading to why, why should we study co-speech gestures? So analyzing co-speech gestures for the presence of constituents uh, can help us in a variety of tasks like uh, cross-modal transla uh, translation, style transfer, uh, and even grounded language understanding. Uh, and it could you know, help us draw close connections uh, between different forms of uh, multimodal data, uh, like your uh, images, audio, as well as text components. Yeah, next please. Uh, in this slide, I would like to bring to your attention two constituent dimensions, which are most relevant to the study of gestures. And they are uh, perspective. The perspective like Tiago had mentioned before, it's, it basically relates to a vantage point or position of an object, uh, which, which varies according to how, a, how an observer perceives it. And the second is prominence. Prominence is basically, uh, it refers to how the level of importance relates to different elements in a scene. Uh, again, from, a, from an observer's point of view. And in terms of hand gestures, uh, saliency can be measured like, you know, the, the size, based on the size, the, the, the part of the hand or the arm which is used, uh, or maybe the maximum, maximum height of the gesturing hand and so on. Uh, in this slide, uh, we list down different gesture categories relating to hand gestures to do our preliminary investigation. We focus on uh, hand gestures for now, mainly to limit the scope of our problem we are trying to solve. Uh, as you know, there can be multiple possible interpretations to jointly detect human body, uh, hand, facial, and other good key points. So as you can see in this slide, uh, we use primarily four different gesture types. The first is body part, and it could you know, mean the left hand, right hand, or both hands, and then you got access which is basically on a horizontal or on a vertical plane. Uh, and then the third is a direction, which basically constitutes the gesture on a, on a spherical coordinate. And the fourth is the shape. If it's, is it a straight uh, hand posture or is it arced? The next please. Right, so, so uh, we had to come up with a data set to, to basically, uh, run ablation experiments and to do our analysis. Uh, but uh, that we had certain obstacles in between to access the right set of data. Uh, but after a lot of attempts, we came across this data set, which was uh, released by researchers from CMU. It's called the PATS data set. And it's an acronym which stands for uh, POSE uh, transcription. Uh, post aligned transcription. Uh, so it basically contains uh, a, a data set of 25 speakers having different styles uh, taken from talk show hosts, lecturers, uh, YouTubers, and uh, tele evangelists. Uh, and the total speaking hours is about, is, is more than 200 hours of data. And uh, these the, the audio modality further contains features like uh, uh, male spectrograms. Uh, the text modality contains word tokens, word embeddings, word to wake embeddings, and so on. The visual, the visual modality contains open pose feature available as 2D skeletal key points. 
Yeah, next please. Uh, in this slide, uh, I want to highlight two important concepts. The, the first is lexical triggers, uh, which basically constitutes the start and end positions of the span or the span boundaries we want to query. Uh, on the other hand, lexical contests refer to the larger sentence or the text or the lex or of the lexical trigger, which is a, which, a, which it is a part of. Uh, and for our analysis, we use uh, basically four types of lexical triggers uh, from and to, which denote the start and end of a span, first, second, and, and these are chosen primarily based on their cognizance of ordering of a given uh, frame. Uh, for instance, first and second is, a, is an ordering lexical trigger. Uh, similarly, firstly, secondly also constitutes an ordering uh, trigger. And from to mostly uh, co-occurs with something like a location context. And even here, then is something which relates to positional change. Uh, and in, in the in the case of lexical context, we use the word tokens corresponding to the speech transcript, which was extracted from the Google speech to text engine. Next, please. All right. So in this slide, you can see a sample video of a talk host, Jimmy Fallon, taken from the PATS data set. Uh, with a predefined start and end uh, time. And uh, if you can see clearly that there are four different gesture types and there's a output label, which, which is named as gesture that basically denotes if, if a anticipated hand gesture occurred in this video frame. Uh, so on the right-hand side, you can see all, the, all, the, all, the, all those uh, labels. And this frame constitutes an example of a true positive instance. Because you see there's on, on uh, frame number three and two, uh, you can see clearly that you know, the hand movements have, have changed again okay, from left to right, or, or rather from right to left, from, from the frame number two to frame number three, you can see there's a change in the position, horizontal position of both the hands. So that constitutes that, you know, as as the person had spoken from some place to some place, he has gestured those those terms differently. So this is one way to catch those uh, those uh, basically lexical prompts. Yeah, next please. Uh, in this slide, this is a this is a case where it actually fails. Right, this is a true negative case. What happens here is again consider a sample video of a talk show host, uh, Seth Meyers, uh, again taken from the same patch data set with a predefined start and end time. Now, what happens here is he says the same set of words like from DC to Philadelphia, but his hands are static. So there's no form of gesture movements at all. So this is a case of a true uh, negative instance where. Uh, had it been a different speaker, they would have made a different gesture, right? So there are certain ambiguities arising from, you know, how different speakers use uh, gestures, right? So it's like a, it's a very, uh, it's a trait which is based on uh, a personality. The okay, next, please. Uh, now, uh, basically the problem statement we are trying to model here can be framed as given a video input, we want to identify whether a hand gesture is present corresponding to the hand gestures portrayed by the speaker during the enunciation of the speech portions containing the from to lexical trigger in the training video frames. If it is present, then we want to classify the video frame with the different gesture types such as handedness, axis, shape, direction. If it is not, then we want to classify it as belonging to no gesture type. Now, since the labels are not mutually exclusive, we treat this problem as a multi-label classification problem because you know these uh, types like handedness as well as uh, uh, shape, they can kind of co-occur 
right? So we we make sure that we uh, grab all the notions into a multi-level classification problem. Now to come up with a data set required to solve this classification task, we look to segment a video into video frames of equal time duration of 500 milliseconds. Then we create a, a set of true positives instances, like I mentioned before, we extract the frames, video frames corresponding to the start and end portion of, of the lexical trigger. And to create the negative, two negative instances, we extract the video frames and annotate the ones having hand gestures unrelated to the ones found, found in the true positive set. And we, we will perform the annotations using the red hand rapid uh, annotator tool. Uh, next, I will briefly explain the model architecture. Uh, we use a popular uh, transformer based model to do the classification of a video frame. So first let's talk about the building blocks of this, uh, of this model. Uh, so it consists of different layers. The first is the input layer, which feeds, which feeds in the input tokens. Uh, then is the positional em embedding layer. So as each pixel in a video frame simultaneously flows through the transformers encoder or a decoder stack, uh, the model itself doesn't have any sense of position or order for each pixel. As a result, there still needs to be a way for us to uh, incorporate the order of pixels into a model. One possible solution is to give the model a sense of order would be to introduce a piece of information to each pixel about its position in the frame. So we call this piece of information the positional uh, em embedding or encoding. The further the encoder layer consists of self-attention and also a feed forward layer. And the feed forward is composed of two additional linear layers with a rectified linear unit between, in between them. Uh, that is to say the input is first transformed by a linear layer. The resulting values are then clipped to always be zero or greater. And then the result is fed into a second linear layer to produce the feed forward layer output. And the transformer uses six of these encoder layers followed by six uh, decoder layers. So next is the uh, global max tooling uh, layer, which basically takes a two dimensional tensor of size, input size uh, times the input channel and computes the maximum of all the input size values for each of the input channel. Then there is a dropout, which basically at each training stage, individual nodes are either dropped off or ignored with a probability of one minus P, or it could be kept with a probability of P so that a reduced network is obtained at the end. Finally, we add a dense layer, which is the final classification layer to do our inference. Yeah, next please. Uh, to sum up uh, some of the potential future directions we foresee could be undertaken our uh, first is we can use open source frame semantic parsers, for instance, uh, Sling or open Sesame and so on to extract uh, lexical units and then the, and, and also the frames which are evoked. Uh, the idea is to basically capture the relationship between different uh, semantic frames in a graphical structure such that the, the upper nodes contain shared properties such as event, entity, attributes, and, and so on. And the properties become more specific or, or less generic in the lower layers of the graph. Second is we can rely on annotation experts by supplying them with a questionnaire survey types, which consists of basically a Boolean true false um, questions to enable the identification of uh, construal dimension according to different types of questions being asked. Like, you know, does the frame contain ordering of items or positions, or does it contain temporal information? We can then, you know, prepare a holdout development set to test the model uh, performance accordingly. And with that, I would like to conclude my presentation.
and thank you guys for listening and i hope the session was informational and don't be shy to shoot questions